welcome back. Oh, yeah, right. Welcome back, everybody. So we will continue with the positive geometry lecture series, and we will have the second lecture of uh, Tomac. Please, uh, you can start. Thanks, thanks, Gabriela. Okay, so I, I will continue on, on what I was talking about yesterday. So yesterday, I, I wanted to give you a flavor where geometry can appear uh, in, in, the, in the context of scattering amplitudes. So what we learned, uh, that there are two main facts which are important and uh, I will build on them today. So the, the first, uh, so recap, first fact is that scattering amplitudes um, are functions of kinematics. So we, we have some kinematic space. Uh, in, in our case, it was uh, in this case of adjoint or bi-adjoint uh, scalar theory that was a space of Mandelstam's. And then in this space, uh, what the amplitude is, is just a function. Uh, modulo the, the, the for, uh, I mean, the, the momentum conservation, but we, we just always have it there. So we, we don't think about this too much. OK, so that's the first fact. It's a function. And the second fact is that uh, to, I mean, if I take every partial amplitudes, uh, amplitude uh, in the case which we studied, so in the uh, by or in the adjoint um, scalar theory, uh, it leads to a polytope. So if I study the singularity structure of this, uh, of this amplitude, it leads to a polytope uh, of dimension uh, so if I, if I take a n uh, partial amplitude, it, it will be uh, a polytope of dimension n minus 3. OK, so just look at the amplitude. I see that there are some similarities. I just start to study the singularities, uh, take residues, and then see further singularities. And I can just explore this combinatorial structure. And this combinatorial structure is exactly the same as the uh, combinatorial structure of boundaries of the isosahedron. OK, so uh, yesterday we saw it in the lecture for five points. In the tutorials for six points, for six points is, uh, is this three-dimensional shape with uh, nine faces and 14 vertices. And uh, uh, it completely encodes the combinatorics of the, of the amplitude. But we would like to do something be better. I mean, we'd like to, uh, so the, the way we did it, we, we just started from uh, Feynman diagrams and we just derived the amplitude and then studied its properties. But we would like to do something different. We would like to be able to construct the geometry and then read off the amplitude from it, okay? But in order to do that, we need to make one, one small modification. Uh, so it is not possible to uniquely uh, attach a function to a geometry. So that, that's, that's something which we don't know how to do. But instead, what we know how to do, we know how to how to attach a unique differential form. So, so the, the, the one statement which will be very important for today, and uh, I, I mean, we will use it. Uh, we will talk about in the language of differential forms from which we, uh, the scattering amplitudes can be extracted. But we need to go from functions to differential forms. Okay, so that's the, that's the main modification we really have today. So differential forms, these are differential forms on the kinematic space. So uh, you, you'll see some examples later, so, so I will not give ex examples now. Uh, so what, what we want to do, we will take, we will try to define a geometry and then uh, find a unique differential form on this geometry. And this leads us to the notion, which is the main, main notion in this uh, whole lecture, which is the notion and definition of the positive geometry. So this lecture today will be a bit more mathematic, um, focus on mathematics. Uh, we'll start from the definition of a positive geometry. I'll give you uh, the conditions which every positive geometry has to satisfy. I'll tell you how to think about the differential forms. And then what I will do, I will give you some examples, some basic examples. And the, the most basic examples which we know are just convex polytops. So this lecture, we just focus on uh, the basic examples of uh, positive geometries, the convex polytops. Okay, so let's start from the definition of positive geometries. So there will be two ingredients, and that's important that they, they come hand in hand, really. So there are two main ingredients, uh, which will be important here. So one of the ingredients is really the geometry. So that's, uh, that's the shape, that's, it's a set, the subset of kinematic space. Uh, in our case uh, of the adjoint or bi-adjoint uh, scalar theory, that would be the isosahedron. 
Okay, so there will be some shape, some polytope in that case, but to more in more generally, it will be some subset of kinematic space or some sometimes an auxiliary space, uh, which will uh, I mean it will, it will just define some bounded bounded region in the uh, which will which will be important in the context of, of amplitudes or general positive generators. Okay, so geometry is a set, and then the second ingredient is that just the differential form. So these two things they, they come hand in hand. And differential form is such that that it knows about the geometry, and, and there's a unique way of defining the differential form if you know the geometry. Okay, so in a bit more detailed before I go to the, to the explicit definition, let me just say some words. Uh, so there will be some words which I will not explain, but you might not understand. Uh, I mean, you might not be familiar with these notions, but. They're not so important because at the end we'll talk about polytops mostly, and in that case all these things simplify. But I will I will, I will be quite uh, quite general here. So uh, the geometry uh, what we take we take a complex variety uh, x. So there will be uh, some some complex space uh, which will provide um, an ambient space. So that will be some. Um, this will be like a static stage, so ambient space for our geometry. And then there will be a subset, a subset of this space, which I called x positive or x non-negative, uh, which is a subset of its real slice. Okay, so what we think about, we think about a, there is a complex space, and then inside of this complex space, there's some real slice, so that uh, there is a complex dimension d of our space x, and then there is a real slice of dimension of, of real dimension d, uh, which I called x not negative. So this x here, and uh, we will define what this. Uh, I mean, we we will say what this subset has to satisfy in order to define a positive geometry. Okay, so you don't need to know what a vari variety is. Uh, if you know what projective space is, that's that's sufficient. Okay, and then the second thing is a differential form. So still without going into details. Uh, so that this, this differential form will depend on this x and will depend on this positive uh, of the subset of the positive slice. And what it will be, it will be a meromorphic. So if you know, don't know what meromorphic is, just think about rational. So it's a rational differential form, meromorphic differential form. Uh, and so this is a meromorphic form. So it's a complex, uh, I mean, the form defined on the complex space. So this is a meromorphic differential form on X. And uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, it, it has a, the following property. So this is such that such that uh, it is logarithmic logarithmic uh, when approaching any boundaries approaching um, any boundary of x positive or x not, not negative, okay? So what does it mean that uh, it behaves logarithmically? Uh, it means that if I have some, if I have some boundary here and there's some coordinate called z, uh, which goes uh, away from this boundary. So this boundary corresponds to some z equals to zero and we have a, um, a parameter which parameterizes our our uh, our geometry. Then, if we approach this this boundary, so when when we go to z equal to zero, then our omega x x positive it behaves as uh, let me just write write as d log z. So that's the reason why it's called logarithmic, uh, which is the same as saying it behaves as d z over z, which means that it has a simple pole. Okay, so when we discuss about residues, so, so if you look back in our functions, when we talk about functions, we can talk about residues, and the residues are just coefficient in front of the simple poles of our function. So the same, uh, so, so we want to generalize the statement uh, to differential forms. So we want to talk about differential forms, which, which also have this behavior, which is the, the simple pole behavior, but it's a differential form. So it's a, in, the, in the numerator, there is also dz of the parameter which we consider. Okay, so, so what we want to do, we want to find a differential form which behaves in this way uh, when we approach any boundaries. And then moreover, so, so this is uh, this is at approaching any boundary of uh, X positive. And uh, moreover, then what we can do when we approach this, this boundary, we can define a residue procedure, which is a, gener uh, a generalization or 
the equivalent uh, definition to the one which we have for functions uh, and uh, find what the differential form on the boundary is. So we, we start with the bot in about, we approach a boundary and we can do take a residue and we can find uh, what the differential form on the boundary is. It's the same story as we as we uh, considered yesterday. We had a function, we took some residue and had another function which still had some singularities. So that the only difference now is that instead of functions, we have differential forms. Okay, so I, I want to be a bit more precise now. Uh, the, these are these two main ingredients. And uh, if you have any questions now, then probably it's a good time to, to ask them. Uh, but if not, then I just go through the definition. And the definition is a recursive definition. Uh, it will contain a bit more mathematical uh, notions, which again, you don't need to understand to understand later what, what we'll talk about. Okay, so the, the formal definition is the following. Um, and when I talk about this definition, you can again think about our polytopes. So for, for uh, every polytope, every convex polytope is a positive geometry. So it will satisfy this condition. So it's thinking about polytopes embedded in some complex amb ambient space, and you, uh, you will be able to, to visualize or get some intuition about what this definition is saying. Okay, so again, uh, to be more precise, what X is, so X is a complex, as I said, it's a complex space. Uh, it has to be projective. Uh, uh, so it, it has to be defined up to rescaling of all its coordinates. Uh, algebraic variety. So algebraic means that uh, it can be defined as some solutions to some polynomial, as a set of polynomial equations uh, variety uh, of some complex dimension D. Okay, so we have, uh, we said, uh, I mean, we have dimension, it's a D, it's a complex, complex dimension D. And then we have another ingredient, which is uh, this X positive, which is a subset of X, which is just, and then it's important to say that in an oriented set. So again, when, when you think about polytops, polytops uh, can be oriented. Uh, they, they, can, they, have, they can have the same orientation as the orientation of a coordinate system, for example, uh, of the real dimension uh, D. So, this, so in, in, in the case of polytopes, this X non-negative is our polytope and then, then capital X is some complex uh, projective space uh, where this polytope is embedded. I mean, you can always take any co complex polytope and embed it in uh, um, a complex projective space. Okay, so now uh, a D-dimensional uh, positive geometry Geometry uh, is a pair, so this x x positive. Uh, I will quite often say positive instead instead of non-negative. It's important to, to write non-negative, but uh, it's faster to say positive, and I'm more, more used to it. So anytime I say positive, I mean non-negative. Non really. uh, so equipped equipped with uh, a unique. So that's important. It's unique, uh, as I said, it would not be important if we talk about functions. Because through some reparameterization of our polytope, we've got a different function when we talk about differential forms because they are logarithmic, uh, they, they can be defined in a unique way. So non zero differential form. Uh, so it's a D form, that's important. So that it's a D form, uh, D, the dimension of the space, which I would call omega x, x positive. Uh, satisfying the following uh, recursion. So recursive definition satisfying the following conditions. So we we start from. Uh, I see that I'm a bit uh, delayed in my tablet. I hope that that's not causing a problem. Okay, for d equal to zero. So if we take d equal to zero, that's that's uh, it's a zero dimensional space. That is just one case which we can take. So it has to be a point. So X and X positive is a single point, a single real point. And uh, the omega, so the differential form, uh, so it's a zero form, zero form is a scalar, uh, but we we set it to be plus or minus one. So it can be only plus or minus one, it can be plus two, for example. Okay, so it's plus or minus one depending on uh, the orientation of the space, orientation of X positive. So uh, that's something which is not, not so standard, but we can orient 
a single point as well. You can just say that it's oriented in one way or the other. And in one way, in one case, it will be plus one, in the other case, it will be minus one. Okay, so for each point, uh, we will have a plus or minus one, the differential forms. Now for D larger than zero, uh, it's, uh, so now, now we want to, uh, we want to say something about the recursive statement. So we want to say how the D dimensional uh, positive geometry is related to D minus one dimensional positive geometry. And then because we know what D equal to zero is, then we'll be able to, to check that conditions are satisfied for a given uh, geometry. Okay, so for D positive, uh, every boundary, uh, so every boundary component, uh, boundary component is not so well defined. Uh, when you think about uh, uh, polytopes, but a boundary component would be a face, for example. So every boundary component, which I call C, C not negative uh, of X, X not negative, uh, is again a positive geometry. So that's it's a recursive way of, of defining things. So it's a positive geometry, uh, but uh, so importantly of dimension uh, d minus one. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, it's not any positive geometry. Uh, the, the, the differential form on the boundary component uh, is related to the differential form on the x itself. So what we need to assume, I mean, what we need to define, we need to define that moreover, the, the form omega, uh, is constrained constrained by uh, the residue relation. So in other words, the differential form which we have on the boundary is just a residue of the differential form which we have in the ball. Okay, so the residue, I define this operation in a second, the residue of x, x positive has to be just the uh, the, the, the differential form for the boundary C. Uh, so this is along the boundary C. Okay, so, so what it means, it means that uh, if, I, if, if you find some differential form uh, in the bulk, in the, in the full object, in the d-dimensional positive geometry, then you can derive what, uh, for each boundary component of this geometry, you can derive what the differential form on the boundary should be. And the differential form is just given by this formula, right? So then the differential form on the boundary is just the residue along this boundary uh, of the differential form in the bulk. And then you can continue because it's a recursive uh, uh, definition. So you can continue and you can go to codimension two, codimension three, and so on. And at some point uh, at codimension D, you, you'll end up with points and you will need to end up with plus or minus one. Okay, so there, uh, not every differential form which you define in the bulk will have plus or minus one at the end uh, at, at each zero dimensional boundaries. Uh, but if a uh, geometry is positive, so if, if, this, if, some, if some region uh, is, a, is a positive geometry, then it is possible to define a unique differential form such that when I do this uh, residue procedure up to points, then I always end up with plus or minus one. Okay, uh, in order to, to complete this definition, I need to say what the residue is, uh, really is. So uh, we know what the residue for functions is. Uh, the residue for differential forms is quite similar. So uh, let me just define what it is. So residue of a differential form. So let's take the differential form, uh, let's call it small omega. Okay, so, so let, let me make a, a, again a picture. So we have, uh, we have some shape here. So this is our X uh, positive, and then it has some boundaries. Uh, so one of the boundary components would be the C uh, positive. Uh, it can have more boundary components. It could be a polygon, for example. But important fact is that there is a there's always a possibility to to parameterize this uh, this shape. So this X zero, X positive using. So let, let me just write it here. Uh, using some coordinate z such that when when we are at the boundary z is equal to zero. Okay, so we we just define a, a holomorphic coordinate uh, such that uh, at at the boundary z z is equal to zero and just cross to the right uh, so to the, in, inside the bulk. Okay, so so what we have we have uh, that z is uh, some holomorphic 
uh, just think about the coordinate. It, holomorphic is not not important word. It's a coordinate uh, such that such that uh, z is equal to zero uh, parameterizes uh, c or c c positive. Okay, so we have some some variety x and then some subvariety c, and then we parameterize the c by setting z to zero, and then z is different than zero everywhere else. Okay. Okay, so so this is this is one one set of so this is a single coordinate, but there, there are also the uh, perpendicular coordinates. So there there will be some uh, remaining coordinates. Call them u. So u are the remaining coordinates. So if this is possible, I mean, if, if we parameterize this way, then um, in order to define the residue, the following thing has to happen. So omega. Uh, can be rewritten in this coordinate. So we can take omega and just write it in terms of z and u. And uh, omega has to have a, a simple pole at z equal to zero. Okay, this is what we said. So it's simple pole means dz over z. And if this is the case, is that the question? You were using, you were using capital omega earlier for the uh, simple form. Uh, yeah, so so sorry. I I I mean for any any omega here, you're you're correct. I just don't. I mean, uh, I, I could use capital omega. That, that's fine as well. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Okay. Uh, it's I, I just, yeah. I, I don't want to confuse because this is this is something which works for every differential form, not only for the uh, differential forms for positive geometries. But you're right. Yes. So so if I take this omega as a function of u and z, so z is this coordinates which parameterize how far away we are from, from the boundary, and u are all the remaining coordinates, then uh, around z equal to zero, I can express this, I'm sorry, again, capital. It is possible to express this uh, form uh, just just like because there is a there is a logarithmic behavior, I can just extract this logarithmic behavior. It's just dz over z, and then it's wedged with some form that only depends on u, plus some other terms here. So this these are terms that are smooth, smooth uh, when z goes to zero. Okay, so I can always if if I have a logarithmic differential form, so the differential form which behaves logarithmically when approaching boundary, I can always write it in this form that I have uh, explicit logarithmic behavior uh, written here with some differential form wedging it. And then all the other terms are just smooth. That, that, that when z goes to zero, they just go, I mean, they, they just, they, there's no residue, there's no pole there. Okay. So this is always possible for logarithmic differential forms. And um, so there was a there was a question in the chat. Uh, okay, so there's a question. So uh, doesn't the log disappear? Uh, I'm not sure. Ah, so sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So so the question is. Uh, uh, what if z is sent to e to, to it's an exponential of z? Uh, does the log disappear? Um, I mean, if you if you send z to e to the z, then the boundary uh, will be so the new coordinate call it uh, z prime. The boundary will not be at z equal to zero, so that's not an appropriate change of variables. Uh, so you you need to if you want to change variables. Uh, and get something which has, uh, again, boundary at the coordinate equal to zero, the, the exponential is not the correct uh, change of variables because it, it moves zero to one, right? So uh, the, the changes of coordinates which are allowed are uh, polynomials such that they, they move zero to zero. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. Uh, if this is true, if, if I have, um, uh, a differential form which can be written, which is logarithmic, can, it can be written like this, and then I can define what the residue is. So by definition, the residue uh, along along C of omega is just defined as this omega prime. Okay. So if you think back to functions, this is exactly what happens for the functions. So just for a second, just forget about the fact that there is a dz here. Just forget about the fact that there is a wedge here. 
if I had a function which behaves like one over z when I approach z equal to zero, then th that would be the, the, the thing which uh, sits in front of it, so the coefficient in front of it would be the residue. In this case, it's just a simple generalization to differential forms. Uh, I have a differential form instead of a, a function, and then I wedge it with a different differential form, but the residue is defined exactly as a coefficient in front of one over z. But I also need to reduce the degree of the form itself. Okay, so this is how the, the residue is defined for differential forms. Uh, and then if no such pole, so it could be possible that this uh, omega prime is zero. Uh, so it doesn't exist really. So the, there are only smooth, there's only smooth behavior that, that is possible. So if no such pole is present, then uh, we say that the residue of omega is equal to zero. Okay, it means that there was really no no logarithmic divergence. Uh, so that, that the coefficient is equal to zero. Question? Yes. Hmm? So the reason you wanted logarithmic singularity is precisely so you can define the residue in this way. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So if there was a, a, a quadratic uh, pole, for example, then um, so, so so the reason why we want logarithmic is because if, if I had a quadratic one, when you reparameterize your space, you would pick up some coefficients, right? Uh, but so if I take dz over z and um, uh, so so what happens is that if I if I just change z to say alpha times z prime, then this turns again into a, a logarithmic form, right? So uh, I could take also, <clears throat> also some more complicated change of variables, but whichever parameterization I take such that z, goes, z, z equal to zero goes to z prime equal to zero, uh, I will start with a logarithmic differential form and I will end up with a logarithmic differential form. If there was a higher power there in the denominator, that would not be the case. I would get some coefficients. Okay, so that's the reason why we want a logarithmic differential forms. Okay, good. Okay, so that, that's the definition. So let's let's recap maybe uh, again, just saying that a positive geometry is a pair. Uh, when we will talk about positive geometries, we usually talk about this object, this is the important one because this is the one which has which is the real one and it has boundaries at some very particular positions. Uh, and this differential form is logarithmic exactly at the boundaries of X positive. Okay, so we have the space, and we have a differential form, and then the differential form is logarithmic, and it can be uh, so for every boundary component, we can find the differential form of the boundary just by taking the residue. And then importantly, we need to end up with plus or minus one at the very end. So there are some some examples of objects which you, you could find a differential form which will be logarithmic for some time. So for codimension one boundaries, uh, you take the second residue, it's still logarithmic. But that at some point you end up with something which is not logarithmic, and uh, that would not be a positive geometry, and that would not be uh, an appropriate differential form. Okay, so just one more comment: uh, the, this differential form here, so this omega uh, here, uh, I will refer to this as the canonical form. Uh, it's canonical because it's unique, uh, so I will use the word canonical form to 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 indicate this. Uh, the unique differential form which I can attach to a positive geometry. Okay, so just let's 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 see some examples and then I, I list examples in in physics and uh, I might later on I might give you some references in on the Slack channel uh, to to just explore them a bit more and then I will I will tell you some examples explicitly and uh, we just see how how this definition works in in details in in, in examples really. Okay, so. Uh, first, let's let's talk more generally. So, examples of positive geometries with uh, with, with the aim to, to apply them to physics, really. Okay. So, broadly, um, it is a is a a very broad class broad class of and mostly unexplored. So, there's there's a huge class of objects. But only some of them are explored at the moment because they are interested for physicists mostly. So this is a mostly unexplored uh, class of geometries. And in physics, so in the physics context, 
uh, there are two, two classes which are really interested, and we, we saw already one of them. Uh, so one of them are just polytopes, so particular polytopes which are relevant to physics, like the isosahedron we saw already. Okay, so in that case, uh, the X, so this ambient space is just a, a projective space, a d-dimensional projective space. And this X positive is a convex polytope, is a convex, a convex polytope. Uh, sometimes it's a polyhedron, so either it's, uh, it's bounded or it can be unbounded, un unbounded. And examples which are which already saw one of them. So one of them would be a projective embedding uh, of the isosahedron. Okay, so I, I, I can explain how I mean every every convex polytope can be embedded in the projective space uh, in very, very simple way. Uh, so we can take the isosahedron and just embed it in the protective space. So how to do that? If I have some coordinates that I uh, are some coordinates in R to the to the D, so these are coordinates of of, uh, of the polytope, so the vertices of the polytope. Then I can embed it in the protective space just by defining capital Z as one and small Z. Uh, and just think about this projectively, so up to rescaling. So that's an element of the projective space P to the D. So this, these are vertices of the polytope, which now are embedded in the protective space, and every every complex every every convex polytope can be embedded like this. I mean, every polytope can be embedded like, embedded like this, but we only will be interested in convex polytopes. Okay, so as I can take a sahedron, which we saw. Um, uh, yesterday and make it a, a convex, uh, sorry, uh, may make it a projective polytope, and it will be a positive geometry. So it is possible to define a differential form which will satisfy all the conditions which we described, which I described in the definition. Okay, so that's one example. Then there are some other examples in physics, and uh, um, I, I'll give you some some references later. So uh, one one is so-called cosmological polytopes. Which are relevant for uh, cosmology, really, and uh, there are some papers on that. Uh, they there are positive geometries, which are again polytopes, geometries uh, in uh, conformal field theory. So in the conformal bootstrap, uh, you can you can find some polytopes which are also positive geometries, and just use the the, the logic of positive geometries to to say something about uh, CFTs and. Uh, some of the polytopes which we which will belong to the second class, uh, so some of the objects which will belong to the second class, which I explained in a second, which are called cyclic polytopes, also fit fit here. So I will I'll not talk much about those. Okay, so these are polytopes, and uh, all of them, as I said, they can be projective, and uh, they are related to in, and they are related to some observables in some theories, uh, like for example, phi cube. Uh, so in, in so a sahedron is a polytope which is related to partial amplitudes in the uh, in the bi adjoint or adjoint phi cube theory. Uh, cosmological polytopes are, uh, one can extract some information about the cosmology in some very particular cosmological models. And then this trans positive geometries for, for CFTs, some, some information about CFTs. So these are all polytopes. But in order to talk about uh, scattering amplitudes in some more complicated models, not in scalar theories, but in, for example, n equals to four super wheels, uh, we need to go, I mean, we need to define some broader class of objects which are not polytopes and, anymore. And this positive geometries, all of them, uh, the, the ones which are which allow us to define what the amplitudehedron is, what the momentum of amplitudehedron is, they're all related to uh, the positive, the positive Grassmannian. Uh, which is, uh, an object which I will define next in the next lecture, so tomorrow, and I will tell you what the positive Grassmannian is. So you can think about positive Grassmannian and all these positive geometries which rely on positive Grassmannian as curvy versions of polytopes. Okay, so that are not polytopes, but there are some kind of curvy versions. So there are some um, some bounded spaces with some boundaries, but the boundaries are not 
hyperplanes anymore. They are curvy. And because of that, some behaviors which are not possible for polytops are possible there. And you will see it in, in some examples. So what, what we can have here, so we can have uh, the amplitohedron. Uh, the amplitohedron is a positive geometry. At least it's conjectured to be a positive geometry because it, there's no proof of that. But it's conjectured to be a positive geometry. Momentum amplitohedron. And uh, there is also an object which is called a corollahedron. So all of them rely on, on positive Grassmannians. And I will explain. So I will talk about amplitohedron and momentum amplitohedron in the last lecture. OK? So they are very interesting objects, uh, uh, kind of counter, counterintuitive. Uh, uh, that if, if you think about them as generalizations of, of polytops, they, they don't behave as polytops uh, quite often. They have some strange properties sometimes. So one, can, one has to develop a new type of intuition to, to talk about them. Uh, but they're very useful, and they are exactly related to scattering amplitudes in n plus to four super meals. OK. So these are the examples, and uh, but I wanted to give you some basic examples and just go through the definition and just just uh, just explain it in some very very simple setting. So uh, we start with something which is extremely simple. Uh, so the simplest possible uh, convex point of which we, which we know is a segment. So it's a line, line segment. So line segment from A to B. Okay. So that's a convex polytop, a one dimensional convex polytop. Uh, so let's try to identify all the, uh, all the information which we, um, which we have in the, in the positive geometry definition and uh, just write it down explicitly. So what X is, so X is just P1. So that, that's a one dimensional complex uh, projective space. So I should say CP1, but it's, it's, a, it's a complex version of it. Uh, the X positive is just the segment. So it's a subset of the real slice. So if I have a, a project, if I have a, a, a projective space P1, then uh, the real slice is a real, uh, is a real projective space uh, and I can define the segment there. Okay, so, so this, is, this is what I have. I have a, a segment from A to B. Uh, so now I tell you that say, it, it is a positive geometry, but in order to check it, I need to define for you, I, I need to give you what, uh, what the differential form, so what the logarithmic, what the canonical form for this uh, segment is. So we need to find what the omega of x, x positive is. And I just give it to you, and then we check that this is really the case, that it, it is a positive, uh, it is, it behaves exactly as the definition uh, asks uh, this to, to behave. So uh, if this is x, then the differential form, which, which is a canonical form on this on the segment, is just dx over x minus b minus dx over x minus a. Uh, we can write it in various different ways. Uh, you can check that this is the same as d log x minus b over x minus a. That's another way of writing the same thing. Or the, if you bring together this to a common denom denominator, then you'll find that this is the same as b minus a over um, x minus b times x minus a dx. So it's a one form. And then uh, what, we want to do, what we want to do, we have to check that this is a one form which has uh, an appro appropriate properties when we approach all the boundaries of this subject of, of our segment. OK, so the segment has two boundaries. So there are two boundaries. when x is equal to a or when x is equal to b. Okay, so in order to check that this is a positive geometry, we need to check that uh, this, uh, this form is logarithmic at these boundaries and then uh, we need to find what the residue is. And because the, the boundary is a point, then we need to find that the residue is equal to plus or minus one. Otherwise, it would not be a proper, uh, uh, a proper differential form. Okay, so let, let me just check at, at z equal to a and then you can check the same at uh, x equal to b. Okay, so I'm sorry, that's a, that's x. So what we need to do, we need to find this parameterization. You remember, in order to find the, the residue, we need to find the parameterization for which uh, our parameter is zero at the boundary. So that's not the case here. The, at the boundary, the x is equal to a. So we need to change variables. So let's introduce z equals to x minus a. 
And let's change variables. Because, so in this case, Z is equal to zero for this boundary. So that's the proper parameter which we need to do, which we need to use. Um, and uh, we can take our differential form. So we take the differential form here and just replace, change variables uh, and use Z instead of X. So this is Z minus B plus A minus DZ over Z. We can check that this is really the case. And then we can check that this is singular or even more, it's logarithmic, so singular at z equal to zero. But this one is regular, regular at z equal to zero. So if you look at the definition of what the, what the residue is, uh, we just drop this, this part. It's not interesting for us when we calculate the residue. So this, this does not contribute. The only contribution comes from here. And the residue when uh, x is equal to a of this omega, positive is equal to minus one, which is exactly what we what we what we want. So it, it has to be either plus or minus one. And you can check that if you take the residue at x equal to b of this omega, performing a slightly different change of variables, but but just moving the, the boundary to z equal to zero, you'll find that this is equal to plus one. And this is also uh, appropriate for the definition of the um, uh, of the positive geometry. Okay, so uh, that's that just proves that uh, this this segment, together with uh, this differential form here, is a positive geometry. Okay, so that's the simplest possible example. And then let, let me just run very very brief, briefly through this uh, uh, embedding which I discussed before. So uh, everything here was described in terms of uh, a real line, really. So it's a segment of a real line. But you can think about this as in a projective way, uh, in the way I explained bef uh, before. So you can do a projective embedding, in exactly the same way as, as I explained before. So uh, you you can define z one as um, one a so that this is just a coordinate so so we had x equal to a was uh, uh, one of the ver vertices of our polytope uh, so when i do a projective embedding it will turn into a point which i put z1 which has coordinates one and a everything is modular uh, uh, modular rescaling because we we want to think about this in a projective space and then z2 is one b uh, so that there was another boundary at x equal to b, so another vertex, uh, which after we do the projective embedding just turns into this point z, z2 equals to one, 1 and b. And then we also need to take our coordinates, so, so the, our coordinate was x, and we also need to embed it uh, projectively, so we just put it uh, together with 1, so 1x one is, uh, is a generic point in our space, and I call this generic point as uh, capital Y. Okay. So in that case, what we can do, we can uh, uh, we can just write explicitly this this formula here. So this formula here, uh, let's say this or this one, can write explicitly using this uh, projective uh, coordinates. So the z1, z2, and y, and we can check that the result is so p1 uh, a b. So the, the this uh, canonical form turns out to be and I'll just introduce this, this notions here. So this bracket, uh, Z1, Z2 over two, that's uh, right, uh, Y, Z1, Y, Z2, uh, where this bracket here is just, uh, this is just a determinant uh, of the minor. Uh, so it's a determinant of a matrix, uh, which, uh, which you can find just by, by taking Y, uh, and stacking together with Z1 in that case. So this is the this, this determinant of the of Y, this is a Y, and this is a Z1. So this determinant is just equal to A minus X. This one is uh, 1X, 1B. Uh, so this one is uh, equal to B minus X. Now this one is just uh, 1A, 1B. So that's B minus A. And this object here is, uh, I mean, it's very similarly, uh, it's a determinant of one X, so that that's Y. And uh, DY, so what is DY? DY is zero DX 
Okay, so if you calculate this determinant, it's just equal to dx. Okay, so if you plug it all together, you'll find that this this formula here is a projective version. So it's a, the, the same differential form, but written in the projective space in this very nice way using the invariant brackets on the on the projective space. So th these brackets are kind of similar to the, to the uh, spinner brackets which are used to in angular numbers. Sorry, Tomac, yeah. uh, but why you say there is a factor of uh, two at the denominator? Um, Don't things should be there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're you're correct. I, I yeah, it shouldn't be there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it will be there later, but you're right. Exactly. So, so this is a segment. So that's the simplest, simplest possible um, uh, uh, positive geometry. Uh, but we can generalize it very, very simple in a very simple way to something slightly more complicated. So, for example, the next simplest thing is a triangle. Uh, if we want to increase the dimensionality of our space, or just going farther. Uh, all possible simplices. So what we can do, we can take projective simplices. And projective simplices are also positive geometries. So I write everything already in the projective space, but you can take any simplex and just make the projective embedding and find the formulas, uh, which, which I explained here. OK, so uh, what we'll take, we consider X to be a projective space, uh, M-dimensional projective space. And then we'll take M plus one points uh, in this projective space. But we'll think about this point as, as really points in, uh, uh, in some particular patch of this pro projective space. So as I said, I mean, you can think about this as points where there is a one here, and then there is some uh, other coordinates, uh, which are the real coordinates of, the, of our simplex. Okay, so we take m plus one points in m dimensional space. That uh, if you take con a convex span of it, that's that's a simplex. So we take a convex span. Oh, uh, sorry. Let me call them z i, uh, which are these elements of R with zero ring. So we take the convex span of that eyes, and uh, this convex span is just a, an m-dimensional simplex, uh, which I would call delta m. Okay, so think about the triangle, but it could be a tetrahedron or, or higher dimensional synthesis. Okay. Uh, so I claim that there, this is a positive geometry. In order to do to to show that this is a positive geometry, I need to give you a differential form. So the differential form, uh, and this is where the the, the two came from uh, wrongly. Uh, so there should be m factorial here, but m was equal to one in the previous case. So what will what we find in this case? We we'll find that. Um, that's the proper differential form uh, divided by y z1 up to zm, uh, y of z2 up to zm plus 1, up to uh, y zm plus 1 up to zm minus 1. So what we have, we have, uh, uh, we have these brackets here. So these brackets are generalizations of the of the brackets which we saw before. So these brackets here are just maximal minors, minors of the matrix. Um, so the matrix, I, I need to just stack together y, z1 up to zm plus one. Uh, so this is a ma matrix with um, uh, m plus two columns and m minus one rows. And then I need to just take maximal minors. So m, m plus one times m plus one, um, uh, sub matrices and then take the determinant of them. So this is what maximal minors are. Okay, and uh, and then this object here, so this y d m y, uh, it's also a determinant. So uh, you can can take it as a determinant, so one over m factorial. But you can write it explicitly, and if you write it explicitly, it will look like this: a equal to one up to m plus one minus one to the a y a uh, d y one wedge, wedge, dy a 
is missing. So this is missing. Uh, wedge up to b y m plus one. Okay, so it's a top dimensional form on this uh, on this projective space. Um, okay, so that's I claim that this is a, a differential form uh, which is a canonical form of the of the projective simplex, and in particular uh, we'll show in a second that <clears throat> this all these denominators here they correspond to boundaries of this simplex. Uh, and uh, this this part gives you the differential part of it, and this is just some coefficient which is important. But uh, it it guarantees that the, when I take residues uh, and I arrive to points, then the the, the, the residue at the end is uh, so that the differential form for the for all possible points of the simplex is either plus or minus one. So this is just some normalization here, which is crucial, but uh, uh, it doesn't tell us anything about the structure of the of the object itself. Okay, so then the claim is so the claim is that uh, the PN with delta M is a positive geometry. So the project so the projective simplex is a positive geometry with the canonical form uh, given by this omega uh, PN delta. M. Okay, and you can check it. Uh, what you can do, you can just fix m. So if you take m equal to one, you uniquely see that this formula reduce, reduces to the one we had before. But you could also take some very particular points and check that this is really the case. So let's check, for example, so we can check it in an example. Let's take m equal to two. So this would be a two dimensional object. And let's fix z to something, say zero, one zero zero, uh, z two, one one zero, z three, one zero one. So that's a projective simplex. Uh, you see that all this uh, top components here are equal to one. So I can think about this two bottom components as a two dimensional form, uh, as a two dimensional, as a point in two two dimensional space, and I can depict this triangle. So. If I have an, an X and a Y here, and this is just a, a triangle which looks like this, or this is a zero, one, and one. Okay, so this is Z1 here, this is Z2, and this is Z3. Okay, so that we, I have a triangle, and what I can do, I can just I can just evaluate uh, just using this using this points, this particular point, and the fact that Y is equal to one, X and Y. So just making some generic parameterization in this particular patch of the projective space, you can just evaluate this explicitly and find that the omega uh, will be equal to, so general formula would tell us that this is, um, so that's the formula, uh, two factorial um, yz1, z2, yz2, z3, y z3 z1 uh, but then using the z's uh, and y i can just evaluate explicitly and what well, one finds one finds that this dx dy over y one minus x minus y and then x so you can see that this is a differential form it's a two form uh, our our positive joint is two dimensional uh, it has a singularities and the singularities are exactly the so when x is equal to zero, uh, it's this uh, this edge here. When y is equal to zero, it's this edge here. When one minus x minus y is zero, it's this edge here. So all the singularities here correspond to uh, boundaries of our object. And then what we can do, we can calculate what the residue of this is, uh, of this differential form. For example, going to x equal to zero. So the residue of omega uh, where x is equal to zero, a simple calculation will tell you that this is equal to uh, dy over y minus uh, one minus y. And then what you find, you find that this is exactly a differential form, the canonical form of this segment here, which is exactly the boundary which we approach where, when we took x equal to zero. And then you could continue further, take a residue where y is equal to zero, and you will find one, or you could take y equals to uh, one, and you'll find minus one. So you, you can prove that this is a positive geometry. 
Okay, and you can go, so in order to prove that it's a positive geometry, you need to go to all possible boundaries of all possible dimensions. And then at the end, you need to end up with only plus and minus ones at zero dimensional boundaries, which are the vertices. Okay, so these are, this is another example. These are uh, all projective uh, simplices, but we can, we can, exp uh, we can, um, we can generalize it further. Uh, we don't need to focus on synthesis. We can talk about polytopes, really. So we can talk about convex projective polytopes. Okay. And the claim is that every convex projective polytope is uh, a positive geometry. Um, can you can you guess why? Can you guess? Maybe I ask a question to you now. Uh, can you guess why uh, every convex projective polytope will be a uh, positive geometry? Okay, so think about this, and I'll ask this question after I finish the, uh, my conclusion here. Is so my, my definition of the projective polytope? So, what is a projective polytope? It's similar to projective simplex, uh, I take some number of points, but now the number of points is larger than n plus one. So I take some n points in uh, n dimensional projective space, uh, such that n is larger or equal than n plus one. And then in order to have a, a, a convex polytope, I need to assume something. So we assume that uh, the matrix, uh, which is just a matrix of all the Zs. So I just take all the coordinates and just stack them in the matrix. I assume that this matrix is a positive matrix. Uh, so what does it mean that it's a positive matrix? Uh, it means that all maximal ordered minors, minors are positive. So if this is the case, then now, if I take uh, a convex uh, a convex span of it, Z1, sorry, Z1 up to Zn, so that's a convex span of this Z1 up to Zn. So I take, uh, so what is a convex span? Convex span is just all possible combinations of this uh, Z, Zis from I up to N. Uh, so these are elements in in my projective space, uh, such that the Cs are positive. So that's what the convex span is. Okay, uh, so so I claim that if I define this, I, I take my point and point, and I take a convex span, then I will find a positive geometry. So let me let me come back to my question. Uh, can you can you guess why it will be a positive geometry? So in order to find that this is a positive geometry, I would need to find a canonical differential form and show that this differential form behaves properly on all the boundaries. So there is a very simple way of finding such a form if I just have a convex polytope. And don't see any answers. So let me just, yes, exactly, very good. Because it can be decomposed into simplices. And this is exactly how we find a differential form for uh, convex polytopes. We take a convex polytope, can divide it in uh, simplices, and for simplices, we know what the differential forms are, and we just add, add over all these differential forms. So we, we can find that the omega of, of this convex polytope can be found as a sum of canonical forms, canonical forms of uh, simplices in a triangulation of A of Z. So we take A, A of Z, we triangulate it into simplices, and then we can, uh, for every simplex, we have a formula. So the formula is, is given here above. Uh, so it's here as a formula. Just take all the simplices, just add them together. And it turns out that uh, when we do that, uh, you, we will find a, uh, uh, a differential form for the convex polytope. Okay, and in in exercise which you have for the for today, uh, this is exactly what uh, what I wanted you to, to to show. I mean, you you have a, a case of a quadrilateral, 
and you can take a quadrilateral and uh, you can triangulate it and see that really when you when you take uh, conical forms of these two triangles, uh, you you triangulate it, uh, the quadrilateral into, then you can you can find that the sum of these two differential forms is really a canonical form of the quadrilateral, and you can do this explicitly just by checking that it properly behaves on all the boundaries of the quadrilateral. Okay, so uh, these, are, these are examples. These are simple examples. Uh, which uh, uh, which are positive geometries. So every convex uh, polytop, if you embed it projectively, is a is a positive geometry. And uh, if I can have five more minutes uh, today, then I just wanted to go back to the definition from um, to, to the case from yesterday and just show you that this uh, associahedron, which is a convex polytop, can be constructed directly, and we can extract. Uh, the, the amplitude just from from this construction, so, so we can uh, we can derive the amplitude from the positive geometry. So it is fine. Five more minutes. There, you, you can go on, Tomek, and there is no problem. Okay, so let, let, let me just uh, explain how to find four points, and if time time allows, five points. Uh, partial uh, amplitude. Um, there, there is just uh, maybe one question before in the chat to say uh, different triangulation resulting same differential form. It's a very good question. It's a part of the exercise for today. And the answer is, uh, and you will see it in, in, in the in example in the, in the tutorial, uh, the answer is that uh, the, the form which you find is independent of the triangulation. But it's very interesting to, to check in, on ex explicit examples that this is really the case. So if you take a quadrilateral, you can divide it in, in this way or in this way, and, and you'll find a different, different looking formula, but they are the same. So. Uh, if you are interested in seeing this in in true example, please go to to exercise uh, I mean, to just just solve the exercises from for today. Okay, so I just wanted to to talk about the asahedron for for a second, and there is a construction of the asahedron which is called ABHY construction of the kinematic asahedron. Which allows us to use the the, the problem. I mean, it will allow us uh, to use the, the 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 language of positive geometries in order to find what is the the, the, the partial amplitude for phi cube by a joint or a joint here. So this is based on this paper, uh, which you can look uh, if you if you are interested for uh, I mean to look for more more details. So how this kinematic asahedron is defined? So yesterday I was talking about this Mandelstam space. So the Mandelstam space, for for example, for five points is uh, five dimensional, but the objects we get is two dimensional. So in order to define a proper geometry, we cannot. I mean, we don't define it in the five dimensional space uh, for five points. Uh, we need to restrict our attention to some particular two dimensional space. So. Uh, in order to do that, we what we'll do, we take, uh, we'll define this asociahedron, so I call it AN. Uh, it will be defined as some intersection where this, this is a, a, a positive, I call it quadrant in the quotation mark because it's a higher dimensional sp uh, space. It's a, quad, it's a positive part uh, of the kinematic space, kinematic space. And this is some hypers, uh, some hyperplane, which we define is a hyperplane of a proper dimension. So it's a hyperplane plane of dimension dimension n minus three because our object is n minus three dimensional. So what is delta? Delta is just uh, as I said. It's a uh, uh, sorry. I need to define one more thing. So uh, it was defined in the. Uh, in the tutorial uh, sheet, but uh, I just defined here once more. So we define this coordinate which I called x i comma j, which are just Mandelstams, uh, which are just Mandelstams formed out of uh, consecutive momenta from i up to j minus one. Okay, so these are consecutive momenta i i plus one i plus two up to j minus one. Uh, because uh, if you look at the, at the amplitude in, in this, this partial amplitude, they always depend only on cons consecutive momenta. So this is an appropriate uh, uh, space to, to, to consider our uh, um, our kinematic asahedron. So this is our kinematic space. So what is delta n? Delta n is just you just need to take all of this uh, excess to be non-negative. 
So this is so-called positive region. And then uh, the, to define this, this hyperplane here, so this is, this is HN is an affine and a fine hyperplane uh, defined in the following way. Uh, so it's defined as we need to take some particular combinations. Sorry. Yes. What is the S, S variable that you defined about? Uh, so, sorry, I can say once more. I, I can hear. What, what is S I I plus one and so on? F. Maybe it's better if you write S uh, as a function of the piece, just to be very explicit. This one. Oh, okay, okay, that's the Mangus. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just a man. It's a consecutive. It's a man. Stand form of the consecutive moment. Okay. Uh, okay, so this particular combination, so uh, if I take this combination, i plus one j, uh, you can show that this is just uh, Mandelstam sij. So this is just pi plus pj uh, squared. Uh, so what we need to do, we need to set them to some c's and the c's are constants. Okay, so we have a space of all the possible x's but we restrict them because we assume that this particular combinations, they are constant and uh, positive. Okay. Uh, and we do that for all uh, i, j, n. Important, it, I just want to highlight here, uh, this is a smaller, it's not smaller or equal. So not, not all of them need to satisfy that. Okay. So. Uh, you can, you can just do this explicitly and, and you will see that uh, this, this, uh, this um, affine subspace is exactly n minus three dimensional. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a calculation to be done. Let me just give you an example, two examples. So uh, A4, so that's, uh, that's a, a sahedron which is uh, related to our four particle partial amplitude. And we discussed yesterday that the four particle partial amplitude uh, should correspond to a segment. So we should, we should see a segment here somehow. So if you use this definition, then you'll find that, uh, first of all, x13, which is just s, should be positive, And t, which is x24, should be positive. So that's our positive, uh, pos positive region. And we need to intersect that with uh, our subspace, so the affine hyperplane. And this affine hyperplane is just defined by saying that the, the u, uh, sorry, minus u is constant and positive. Okay. So if you if you look at this definition, this this definition exactly tells us that this positive region has to be intersected with this uh, one-dimensional. Uh, so the, with with this one condition. Right? So if you look at the if you look at the space S and T. Uh, the positive region is just this part here, so S and T positive. And then if you look at the subspace here, this subspace, uh, because S plus T plus U is equal to zero, that's uh, from momentum conservation, then this subspace here uh, is just a line which looks like this, okay? And then we can find what the intersection is. And the intersection, as you can see, the intersection of these two spaces is just this segment here. So we get the segment as we were expecting to get. Okay. And then this is a segment. And on this segment, I can now define a differential form, a logarithmic differential form. Uh, I know that it's a positive geometry. So let, let me define, so let me find what the differential form is. Uh, and you can write it. And the differential form is d log s over t. Okay, and you can check that this is really a logarithmic differential form. When s goes to zero, it goes to one of the boundaries, this one. When t goes to zero, it goes to the other boundary. Uh, so uh, it, it behaves properly on this segment. But moreover, so I can write it explicitly. So this is the, the same as ds over s minus dt over t. And um, on this, so, so notice that this is a, this is a line so uh, we should restrict our differential form, which is written here in two coordinates, 
to this particular line. So what is this particular line? This line is S plus T equals to minus U, where U is constant. So which means that dS plus dT is equal to zero. I can just differentiate this equation. So there is a relation between dT and dS. And the relation is that dS is equal to minus dT. So I can substitute that. And what I find, I find that this dS over S minus dT over T is the same as one over S plus one over T dS. But what I found here is nothing else than my partial amplitude for the adjoint theory. Because we said yesterday that the partial amplitude is one over S plus one over T. Okay, so this, if you run this construction for a higher n, you'll find some higher asociahedra. And for all this asociahedra, it is possible to find what the differential form is. And then from the differential form, it is possible to, uh, the, the, the pr proper word is to pull back. It's possible to pull back on the subspace here and find that the amplitude just pops up as a coefficient in front of the differential part of the differential form. Okay. Again, uh, in my notes, I will, I will include also five points so you can see how it works for five points, but I think that I, uh, I probably exceed your patience now because it's a 15 uh, past, so, so I stop here. But the, the important lesson is that this, the, the construction, so that um, the example from yesterday, this amplitudes, the partial amplitudes which we discussed yesterday, can be extracted from this kinematic astrosahedron when you think about this as a positive geometry, we define a differential logarithmic differential form on, on this positive geometry. And then uh, you, you just uh, you can see that there is this amplitude as a coefficient of the differential part. OK, I'll stop here. Thank you, Tomek, for the very clear, beautiful lecture. That's all. Uh, thanks, Tomek. You muted yourself, Gab. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I will propose, since it's a bit late, to uh, just take one question, if there are, and we postpone the question to maybe the beginning of next lecture and also to the tutorial. So, is there are there any question? Okay, so well, if I'll none, maybe I... if none, maybe I can ask one, which is, uh, could you give maybe an example of the the positive geometries in CFT that you briefly mentioned before, or maybe expand a bit more on what you said? Uh, yeah, so I I think that it will be quite difficult to uh, to give example in like five minutes, uh, okay. but I can explain what. Uh, uh, yeah, I can try to explain what the logic is behind. So the definition of the of the positive geometry there is quite similar to the one we have here. So if you if you know something about conformal bootstrap, then you know that the uh, for the unitary uh, theories CFTs, then the structure constants are real, which means that the, their squares are positive, right? And so when you when you construct a, a partial wave decomposition, you you find that the uh, the Four point correlation function can be written as a, as a sum of some positive coefficients and conformal blocks. And uh, you can find, so, so, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that uh, uh, the, um, the crossing symmetry, so the, the, the crossing equation gives you some relations between uh, uh, structure constants in the, uh, in the uh, CFT. So, the, the first condition uh, corresponds to this. I mean, you can, you can find a subspace. Now you can find a, a shape or a, a polytope in the space of uh, structure constants, where the, the the positivity of the squares of the uh, structure constants in the expansion, in the partial wave expansion, corresponds to this positive region. So there will be some positive region, and then the you can you can rewrite the the crossing equation as some condition which is like this condition for a hyperplane. Okay, so in order to have, uh, so now, now if you have uh, this positive region, you need to intersect with this hyperplane coming from the crossing equation. It, it defines for you some, some polytope. And uh, this polytope is it's a convex polytope. Uh, and I don't remember how exactly uh, people are doing that, but you can extract some information of possible. So there are some bounds on the structure constants which can uh, encode, uh, I mean, you can, you can extract 
using this information. I'm not familiar with details, but I can give you a reference where it's explained. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, uh, Tomek. And uh, we will reconvene at uh, half past noon with the 